morning. I'm living in a small village in Israel, named Roshpina. I don't know if anyone visited over there. We have a little bit more than 200 families. And I noticed the name of your organization is Bina. Bina is wisdom. The name of my wife is also Bina. And I have a good alibi. I tell her I met Bina in LA. And second, it's a very unique name. I believe there are less than 10 women who are carried this name in Israel. Three of them are living in Rosh Pina. Unfortunately, I spent more than 33 years in the military. And usually when I was describing officers of the military or agents of the Mossad, they are tall, blonde, blue eyes, thin, and I'm coming as the anti-tease for this description. And I remember you was had once, you had the chief of staff, his name was Chakashvili. He was almost two meters tall. And I was the commander of the Northern Division. And he came to visit my division. And he was looking on me and a few of my officers. And unfortunately, all of them, well, let's say my size. He looked at me and told me, told me Tell me, all Israeli generals are short. I have to respond. It's something that I couldn't leave. I told them, Israeli generals are very well known about two facts. First of all, brain and courage, balls. And the shorter you, you are, the coordination is better. <laughs> to become a little bit more serious, First of all, it's really a pleasure to be here with a young generation who are interested in Israel and see the, in some way the roots of the emotional connection to our country. I believe it's, a, it's warming my heart to know there are still people who are caring about my country and uh, caring what's going on in the Middle East. And I would try to describe you in the next few minutes a little bit what are the major challenges that uh, Israel is facing? Naturally, for my trade, what used to be my trade, I will discover, describe you the, what I call the external threats. We are facing three external threats. Don't be mistaken, I'm going to use the number three a few times always. Israeli officers have a limit intellectual capabilities that everything we are divided into three. And I will repeat it from time to time, forgive me. Uh, I will try to do it. The first one is a threat because before, beyond the horizon, the Iranian threat. They are smart enough to create a common border with Israel by establishing a proxy on the north borders of Israel by arming and encouraging the Hezbollah organization in Lebanon. They created a close alliance with uh, radical elements inside the Arab world, especially with many of the Shia groups in different countries, and they have a unique relationship with Syria. The other threat, or the other challenge, is what we are calling uh, so-called the Arab Spring. I'm not sure that the Arab Spring is the right expression. The one who invented this phrase is, was a very unique, smart guy because in the connotation, he took a phrase that was appealing in the past from 1848 when new countries were emerging in Europe. An idea of liberalism started to be spread over. They call it the spring of nations. There is no connection between the spring of nations and what is happening today in what is described as the Arabist Spring. The real problem is it's not one phenomena. All of those countries, each by itself, has its own reason. They have a common enlightening factor called Al Jazeera that is creating the right atmosphere 
to the uprise against certain regimes in, in the Middle East. Usually it's done against regimes who the regime was taken by force by a military coup. And in those countries where those events were translated into violence, you could easily see that the military coup that took the regime in the country, it's always raising a question of the legitimacy of the system. And there is a great deal of number of different ethnic tribes, groups, or even different religion who are unwilling to accept and not identify themselves with the goals that are presented with the military establishment. We saw it in Tunisia. If you remember, I don't know how many people of you are remembering that it's not the first two coup that took place in Tunisia. The last one was taken again, Habib Bourguiba. And in Gaddafi, he was thrown out the king of Libya, Idris. And in Egypt, the officers were throwing out King Farouk in the late 50s, in the beginning of the 50s. In Syria, they have a very long tradition of coup, military coups. I think till 1972, there are almost 12 coup military revolutions inside the country. And the last one was formulated by the late Bashar. President uh, Hafez al-Assad, who took over by his regime by eliminating all of his opposition. Incidentally, he faced the same situation in 1980. He solved the problem by encouraging his brother Rifad to send a few divisions to a town called Hama and killing most of the population there. What we are seeing now, it's a repeating of the history. Now. It's done by Bashar Assad, encouraging his brother Maher to do the same job that Rifat Assad did for his father. Strangely, those events are passing with almost no violence in other countries. And the question is why? And the, sim the reason is very simple. Usually it's those countries where, where you have kings, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, uh, the Gulf countries. And the main reason is very simple, because those regimes were part of a coalition and a political understanding among the different groups in the countries. And the king is representing what we are calling the arrangement between the different tribes. As such, what we are seeing in those countries where you have kings, usually those events are passing in a much easier phase. And we are not seeing too much violence. There is a, one exception, exception, this exception is Bahrain. But the real impact in Bahrain is very related to the involvement of the Iranian by encouraging the 70% of the population, the Shia, against the regime, the regime of uh, the family of Khalifa that is controlling, and they are Sunnis. Then it's a religious issue that is going back to the history I will, I will say around the last uh, 150 years. I think that it's creating a certain challenge for Israel, but at the same time, it's creating a unique opportunity for Israel. And the reason is very simple. If you are facing and looking a little bit on the Arab League of today, you will be noticing that most of the radical elements inside the Arab League were disappearing. Gaddafi passed away, Saddam Hussein passed away, Bashar al-Assad is occupied with his own problem, and the most, and even Amr Musa, who used to be the head of the Arab League, is removed now and he's presenting himself as a candidate to the presidency in Egypt. And what we are seeing that Saudi Arabia is becoming the most important factor in the Arab League, and in a way, because they are today involved in a religious conflict inside the Islam between the Sunnis and the Shias, and they are suffering politically on the issue of who will dominate the region between them and the Iranians, I believe the Arab League is presenting today a unique opportunity for Israel 
and a much, much more practical approach to the problem, especially in, because of some of those issues, we are sitting on the same boat together with them. The third challenge is the challenge what I call the radical Islamic organization. Some of them are coming from the schools of uh, the Wahhabi orientation, Wahhabi, Wahhabi Salafi orientation, that it's rooted inside Saudi Arabia. From there, it was exported to the rest of the Arabic world. And eventually, there was a large participation of those elements in Afghanistan. In the beginning, they were throwing out the presence of the Russian, the communists, inside Afghanistan. And later, it turned against the West because of ideological reasons. Those elements are not really on an organization. They are worldwide movement. And in each country, they are creating their own type of organization. And they are locating three types of targets. The first one is usually Americans, because they are considered to be the big Satan. The second one is what we are calling regimes in the Arabic world who are cooperating with the Americans. And this is the reason why countries like Jordan or Saudi Arabia or other countries are becoming a major threat or a ma under, uh, they are facing a, a serious challenge from those organizations. And unfortunately, the last target, not less important, are the Israelis and the Jews. For instance, we saw a few attempts in the past against a synagogue in Tunisia in the, the half island of Jerba. We saw some attempts in Morocco against the Jewish community. We even saw some attempts inside uh, India when the organization called Lishkar al Taibe attacked the members of the house of Chabad over there and killed the few, a few Jews uh, over there. But it was not aimed against Israel because of the Israeli flag. It was aimed because it was an organization that was led by Jews and the Jewish community. This is the third channel, the third challenge that we are facing. The last one is not an external threat. It's an internal problem of Israel. I think that our political problem, our political system, is uh, in a deep problematic situation. We are reaching to a situation where it's not anymore a rule of the majority. We are facing what we are calling the domination of the minorities because the minorities are able to claim and to present their political point of view because usually they are the balancing force between, between the different parties and as such they are becoming a power of balance, of balance to establish governments in Israel and unfortunately because of those reasons they are able to gain a great deal of power and even having uh, what I call a massive impact on the priority of, of the State of Israel. If I will summarize this uh, fact, I will say that anyone who is working, paying taxes, serving the military, is almost not receiving anything from the country. Anyone who is not working, not paying taxes, not serving the military, unfortunately is receiving the support of the state. But I'm not going to elaborate more, but it's least from my point of view, if I'm judging those threats according to the level they are presenting to the state of Israel, I will not undermine the internal threat even, even more, a little bit more, even than the Iranian threat. <laughs>